And once it's up, I'll just introduce and then we can get started. Okay, now we are streaming live, so you can get started and I'll mute myself and you can go ahead. Sure, thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, this, uh, this course is called um, Advanced Data Modeling Techniques in PostgreSQL. Uh, for those of you who are joining uh, uh, via the live stream, please be aware there is a GitHub repo which has the, um, which has the course exercises and such. Uh, you can also get it from the URL on the, uh, on the slides but I discovered that uh, my convention on these slides was not quite right. And so uh, you may have to interpolate that a little bit. Uh, it's just uh, github.com slash, uh, basically just make sure that, that you just take the GitHub uh, uh, repo portion of it and then, then you'll be fine to, to navigate and find what you're looking for. Um, at any rate, I will go ahead and uh, start the slides and uh, we, can, we can get going. So let's go here. Oh, crap. Uh, I have one minor problem here. I will probably have to rejoin this meeting very briefly. Uh, apparently sharing my screen is not, um, is not set up for, uh, what's, the wrong, what's the matter here? Let me just take a look. System preferences. Uh, I do have one one small problem. I will probably have to restart this meeting in one second. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to give me the option to share my screen in um, over here in Zoom. It, it may be a Mac problem. I might just have to switch to to another computer here quickly. Uh, At the bottom of the screen, you should have share screen. Yeah, it's a uh, basically it's saying uh, it doesn't have permission to. Oh, so you got to change the setting. Uh, yeah. advan uh, advanced preferences. Um, I think it's privacy. Security, privacy. And I think it's screen recording, but I don't see. Screen okay. recording, Zoom is down at the bottom. Yeah, one second. Zoom. Uh, it's going to require that I restart Zoom, so I'll be right yep. back. We'll, we'll be here. Okay. We get a little delay here, technical issues. Okay, and um, can people uh, see me now? Yes, I can see that. Great. That's that good it. too. What tool is this? Is this Keemer? Keemer. Sorry? Beamer. Ah, it looks very nice. Yeah, I, I like Beamer. Beamer is my, my, my favorite uh, presentation tool. Okay, I'm going on mute. It's all, all up right. to you now. All right, well, well thank you very much. Um, so I usually start these by introducing myself. Uh, I have got one bug fix into Postgres so far. I've proposed a couple of other ones, but for one reason or another, uh, I've basically only had the time and uh, effort uh, available to push one of them through. 
Uh, I had the Postgres related research and development uh, team at Adjust. Um, and I'll talk about what we do in just a second so you can understand why we do the things we do with Postgres. Uh, I've been using Postgres uh, for over 20 years now. And uh, sometimes that surprises me a little bit, but uh, I think it's one of the best uh, databases out there. And uh, I use it for just about everything from, you know, small projects up to big ones. And so, you know, I've been around the community for a long time. Uh, this includes both as a software developer, database uh, designer, and a database administrator. So what we do at Adjust, we are very big Postgres users. I think we, we clearly have over 10 petabytes of data in our Postgres environments. Um, these are all uh, vanilla Postgres with maybe some of our own pa uh, patches and many of our own extensions. Um, the number's a little bit off. We are now usually uh, up to 600,000 inbound requests a second. Um, and basically what we do is we, we um, referee advertising contracts. So we don't, uh, dis we don't um, distribute ads or anything like that. We just uh, try to like cut down on fraud and say you paid for this correctly and you know this other thing here um, uh, was not uh, was, was a user that came to your application uh, organically. Uh, so basically we're in the analytics business. Um, one thing to note is that we do a lot of analytics use, uh, we analytic workloads on Postgres. And I know a lot of people don't do these. Um, most people use Postgres for uh, transactional workloads, but, but we use it mostly for analytic workloads. So about this, um, about this course, uh, I want to uh, kind of discuss what we'll be covering here. Um, basically, we have um, five basic um, pieces here. We have uh, how we think about modeling data that we can derive from what we've already stored in the database. And this is kind of the really big shift that you can um, make when you move into Postgres from maybe some other uh, systems like uh, uh, MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server or the like. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, options for custom data type usage. And while the exercises here will all be um, uh, relating to just very simple usage of say tuples as data types, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, considerations uh, for writing your own data types in C. Um, we're, we'll talk about uh, use of extracting data from semi-structured data, uh, use cases that I've come across in my career, and uh, ways in which you can take uh, things you can do with Postgres and solve problems that uh, just didn't seem very solvable beforehand. Um, we'll look at inheritance as a tool for solving polymorphic relationships, which is uh, something which uh, tends to get some um, traction occasionally because uh, people look at inheritance primarily as uh, the old way of doing table partitioning, but there are actually some really cool use cases for it. Um, and uh, we, will, we will be covering some of these and we'll, we'll look at this. Um, I did cut out the multiple inheritance and overlapping sets section off of this because uh, originally I signed up for, uh, I, I figured I would have more time uh, than um, I think we, we decided to put into it. And uh, once I added all the exercises, I decided uh, not to do that. But uh, I can talk about that a little bit at the end if we have some extra time. And otherwise people are welcome to reach out to me and uh, ask questions and I can, I can, I can cover that material uh, separately. But I, I don't think we'll have time to go into it. Um, per se. So with that in mind, uh, I want to start off with a quick refresher of the relational database uh, model. Um, the reason why this is really important is that uh, data modeling is primarily a mathematical uh, activity. It's something we tend to think of uh, from like normalization perspectives as something we just kind of, um, you know, reason our way through, but at its foundation, it's a mathematical activity. 
and relation, uh, sorry, normal forms are all rigidly mathematically defined. And so it's really important to kind of understand what the uh, relational uh, model really gives you. Um, it starts off with basically this. A set, of course, is a um, group of, of discrete items which are each unique. So there is a set of people watching this. If we reorder uh, you and put you in different places or, or reorder the list, it's still the same set of people, right? Um, and a relation is just a set of corresponding facts. This is actually really important as, as you think about it. Um, basically, it means that if you, um, if you uh, know one item, you can look it up in that set of facts to get the other item. Um, a relation entry we model as a tuple. This just means a set of facts, basically where um, the ordinal position um, has semantic value um, in, in this particular case. And then we use functional dependencies to uh, allow us to uh, form inferences about the data that we have. So um, all of our SQL queries basically take the data that we stored um, and they ask uh, the database system, in this case Postgres, to draw inferences from that data. And uh, so this is, this is the way we should be thinking about data, is that this is an inferential system. It's there to take what we've stored and draw conclusions from it. And uh, so a lot of the things we'll be talking about here are ways to sort of help that process along. I mentioned that these are inferential systems. They're about drawing inferences. Functional dependencies imply functions. A function is simply a relation where um, uh, the, the domain of that relation is unique. So like um, one fact, um, if you extract one fact out of that relation that that set of facts would then still be unique. Um, and then inferences <clears throat> in the database level are derived through function composition. This is a mathematical process. It means that if you have two functions, that you can compose them and you can take the output of one function, feed it into the next function, and now you have a new function. And there are ways we can, we can manipulate that. Um, as I say, this, this is in the basics section. It's, I should have called it fundamentals because it's not so basic as it is uh, fundamental. Um, and now I wanna go into what Postgres was really designed to solve. And uh, this is a modified version in this query here of uh, a query that I took out of one of Stonebreaker's papers when he wrote for uh, Informix. And basically th this was the query that he uh, suggested would be the ideal um, showcase for what a object relational database system could do. So imagine we have a set of locations, we have latitudes, longitudes, right? We have photos, also another uh, relation. Um, and let's say photos are geotagged, so we have a latitude and longitude for the photo. And we wanna find all photos within um, a particular location's uh, radius of say 100 kilometers. So within 100 kilometers of a particular location where that photo is a photo of a sunset. Now we have a few problems here. Um, the first is for this, for this to work, the database has to be able to do distance calculations, right? So we have to be able to say 100 kilometers means something. We have to be able to calculate that distance on earth points. Um, we have to normalize it. We have to look at the photos and we have to know whether the photo is a sunset. And in an object relational system, we should be able to calculate all of those on the fly. Uh, Postgres provides a very rich set of languages for doing all of this. Um, and I noticed the where clause in this query is not quite um, sufficient. So you can, um, you can, you can take it and, and go forward um, uh, adding additional clauses there. But uh, we could in fact say, well, if we know that the photo is facing west, and there is orange at the top and blue down lower, it's probably a photo of a sunset. And so we could actually do an algorithmic assessment on each photo either at query time or at indexing time 
and we could then uh, we could then run this query. Um, so what's needed to go from that first set of questions to the second? We have to have custom data types that we can normalize and compare. So for example, distance. Um, we need to know whether you know 20 miles is a smaller distance than 100 kilometers, which in this case it is, right? Uh, we have to be able to do custom calculations. And we have to have pluggable calculations based on arbitrary data. So we need to be able to extend the database to know about new data types, to compare data types, to calculate from, uh, to, from, point, um, from certain facts to other inferences. And we have to be able to do this in a pluggable way. So um, if you want a really good example of uh, sort of the uh, degree to which Postgres is extensible in this, of course, I would strongly recommend uh, taking a look at PostGIS. It is probably the best showcase in this area. So um, onto, the, um, onto the first uh, major unit here, which is on derivations. Uh, this is all, all about calculated inferences. So um, this is uh, basically all inferences are calculated, right? But some may just be fact traversals. So if we have an invoicing system and I need to know uh, what the customer's um, account number is based on an invoice. I would typically traverse from the invoice table to the customer table, right? And then I'd pull that data from, from, from the customer table. But other inferences are based on calculating, um, uh, calculated based on a single known fact or single known relation entity. So for example, I might have, um, I might have an invoice, it might have an amount that's, or sorry, it might have a date that it was sent and it might have billing terms. From that billing term and the date that it's sent, we could derive the date it's due, right? Um, and so this section's about that, that's that latter, that last category. What we can do about uh, incorporating this kind of logic in the database so that, uh, so that it can be used by various applications um, which, which uh, use the database. Um, and it's worth noting here that Postgres is really designed to be a database that supports multiple applications. Um, this is very different from MySQL, which is aimed at being, um, which is aimed at the market where you have applications that support multiple databases. So uh, this model where, where we have the database supporting multiple applications means we need to be able to consolidate our data logic, which involves calculating and making all these inferences within the database itself so that this is uh, usable across all the applications uh, we might want to, uh, we, we might want to, to um, connect to that database and, and you know, use, that, use that data in those inferences. So a couple um, examples that we might have of tuple derived inferences. Uh, if I have like notes in a database, I might want to have a standard way of generating a TS vector from a notes table. So I could take the author, the subject, and the contents of the notes, and I could create a TS vector in a standard way. The application wouldn't have to know how that TS vector is derived to do the search. We just simply have a certain convention and, um, you know, we publish what the guarantees are and the application gets to use the guarantees does not have to know the implementation. Um, so that's, that's an example that will get a lot of focus in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. And uh, so, so that's, uh, that's the first one. Another one would be like the area of a polygon. So if we have a polygon item, um, let's say we have a square uh, or we have a triangle, we could, modif we could model this as, for example, an array of points. Um, and we could, for example, uh, calculate this 
based upon um, based upon the tuple record. Another very important one when it comes to indexing is actually the bounding box of a polygon. Um, so if you go and you look at things that like Post just does, uh, a lot of the indexes that you use for geometries and such are in fact uh, indexes of bounding boxes. This allows you to quickly identify the um, the post uh, polygons you might want to evaluate and determine whether, for example, a point falls within them. Uh, instead of searching them all, you, you only have to check those where the bounding box um, is fit in. And so then, um, and so, and so that, that allows us to uh, index queries and that can make a really big difference when we need to do something like determine, for example, what, uh, what precinct a particular address falls in or something like that. The really important point here is that given one X, we get exactly one Y and we can calculate it knowing only X. So given a polygon, we get exactly one area. Given a note, we get exactly one TS vector and there's no room for, um, for interpretation about what that TS vector should look like given the note. Um, and so we can plug this sort of uh, this sort of logic into the database, and we can then use it uh, in in a number of very important ways. So suppose we have this table here um, has a few very simple fields: ID, subject, author, contents. And we want to be able to uh, we want to be able to run this query here. Uh, select star from note where plain to TS query. Uh, Postgres is great is in uh, and basically uh, is found within a TS vector of note. Now there's something that is worth noting here, and it is in fact documented. Uh, we have two different ways in which we can notate this. TS vector note as a function or as a field. Believe it or not, in Postgres, these two are the same. Uh, with one basic, ex uh, as long as you actually have the table name or alias here, um, these two notation forms are effectively equivalent. And there are cases where you may want to prefer one or the other for readability reasons, but, um, but, it's, not actually, uh, but, but it's not actually semantically um, uh, a problem in relation to Postgres. And this is, this is old Quell stuff. I think, uh, I think this equivalency predates actually uh, Postgres supporting SQL. So here's what we can do for, um, for a TS vector. We can have a very, very, very simple function, create uh, or replace function, sorry, should be TS vector, not TES vector. Probably autocorrect may have bit me there. Takes in a note. So it takes in the whole row. It returns a TS vector. Language is SQL. And very important here is it is immutable. Now a function can be immutable in, uh, in Postgres uh, responsibly if you always have exactly one output for the input and it does not de uh, depend on anything else stored in the database. So an immutable item is not supposed to ever change just because you saved more data in the database. Let me repeat that because this becomes very important. An immutable function's output is not supposed to change just because you saved more data in the database. Um, the reason why this is important is that immutable functions can be calculated um, at planning time. So they can actually be calculated before we, um, before we come up with the full planning time. I th actually, I think they can be calculated at parsing time, actually. Uh, so by the time we get a query plan, we can have actually run these. 
Um, but the second reason is that if we have that guarantee that this output isn't going to change just because we added more data to the database or updated something outside of what we're passing this function, then we can actually index the output safely. And we're guaranteed to get a usable, out, um, we're guaranteed to get a usable result. So uh, if you need to take, uh, if you need to use functional indexes, make sure not only that you mark your functions as immutable, but make sure that they really are immutable. Here it's immutable because we know the type. We're not looking anything up on disk and we're just taking whatever we passed in and we're calculating a TS vector based on it. So I mentioned indexes. We can create a uh, index on note using gin, TS vector note. We can change the function and reindex. If you change the function, it will invalidate the index. So you have to reindex at that point. Otherwise, your index won't be used because, well, the uh, output of the function is not guaranteed to be the same as it was when you built the index. Uh, the other major important point here is that these are then calculated on write, not on read. So if you have a case where you are uh, doing a lot of these searches, uh, but you're only writing data much less often, then it makes sense to, uh, to basically um, front load your uh, resource uh, um, utilization by calculating things when you write it and then uh, just being able to not even run the function when you read. So if you make this index, then when you make the query that we suggested here before, um, Postgres isn't even gonna run that function. It's just simply gonna go, oh, I have an index of the output of that function. I can use it for this query. And there's never a point where that function has to be run. It was run when we stored the data and the, the result was uh, stored in the index. So uh, fun with notation. So quick, which of these four does not work? Remember TS vector is a function, subject is a field. Only one of these four will not work. It is this one. You can refer to fields using a function notation. This is left over from Quell. You can refer to a, um, a single argument function that, ref that only takes in a row type using a field notation. And these will all just simply work. Uh, we'll, as we get into this further, we'll start to see cases where um, this notation, uh, this functional notation for, uh, for fields actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, it, it, it's kind of counterintuitive that that would ever be useful, but uh, especially when you start dealing with uh, composite data types and things, um, that actually starts to be really, really, really handy because it avoids um, a lot of extra parentheses So uh, let's go on to the first uh, exercise. And uh, please take um, for, uh, please clone this GitHub repo or just simply go to the GitHub repo and, and navigate to exercises one. And uh, I want to take about uh, 10 minutes for, for people to, uh, to kind of go through the exercise. And then um, I want to kind of open things up for immediate questions on, um, on this first unit. I haven't seen any questions raised on IRC yet. Well, either that means that, that they are following it or it means that they are not following it, or <laughs> I don't know. Ho hopefully we will get some good questions in a bit. 
If anyone on Zoom has questions, raise your hand, please. It's worth noting that uh, for the DB dumps, you probably don't want to run them in a single transaction because um, PG dump has a tendency of assigning permissions to roles that were present on my system that may not be present on your system. So uh, just go ahead and uh, ignore, um, uh, ignore the permissions issues. And I have a question from uh, Martin Ritchie. How does defining an index using a function differ from the new generated columns in Postgres 12 from a performance and indexing point of view? Um, that's actually a great question. Uh, believe it or not, I have not um, played around with the, uh, with the generated columns in Postgres 12 uh, that much. Um, I don't quite know how they're stored. I'd have to I'd have to dig into that a little bit. Um, uh, please reach out afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I will do my best to uh, look into it and get an answer for you. Um, just guarding my guesses, though, uh, I don't think you'd have a major difference in uh, performance um, uh, and indexing if it comes down to um, if it comes down to um, like using this for filtering. I, I don't know what happens, though, in the event where uh, you actually have to return the column. That would be the one thing that I would think might possibly be a difference. Um, again, I'd have to look carefully into the implementation to be able to give you um, a, a complete answer on, uh, on what happens in that particular case.
Chris, can you see the uh, Zoom chat? Yes, so that's why I was responding to Martin Richie's. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you if you were or not. Yeah. Just asking. Thanks. Yep. So does anybody have uh, any um, uh, questions or observations uh, from this first exercise at all? I'm just gonna give it two or three more minutes and then, then we'll pick up again. So if anyone needs to take like a, a quick um, break or something. All right, well then, um, if there are no other questions, uh, I guess uh, I will move on to the second uh, portion here. Um, so now let's look at a particular example, extracting data from structured text. Now, this is actually kind of an important uh, example because it shows you some corners that you can get into uh, once databases have been designed and are operating where some of uh, this sort of functionality can, um, can really kind of help you out a lot. Uh, the question was why we truncated the search path. I had to prefix everything with public dot. Uh, this happens when you load a dump that was generated by PSQL. No, PG dump. Uh, if you leave, if you leave and re-enter the session, you'll have your old search path back. It's an artifact of uh, using. Um, it's an artifact of using the standard logical backup tools of Postgres. Uh, this has actually a couple of other uh, nasty effects. For example, if you use a custom type uh, that's defined in a particular schema, and you have a view that's defined with null if, then it's not going to find it when it. Re re um, when, when you when you load the dump, um, but but PG dump always always um, always truncates your search path uh, for you um, at the point where it's uh, so so that when you restore it, it has a a clear and consistent way to do that. Uh, 
Um, and just as a note to, to, to Russ, um, one thing I would strongly suggest if you're not fluent with PLP GSQL is uh, switch to SQL language um, functions instead. With a very few exceptions, uh, most of these exercises should be able to be done in SQL. And I'm, I just want to give a quick example of that before we move on. If we, if we go, um, if we go back to this function here, which is one way in which we could have solved um, some of uh, like created TS vector from, from a note. Um, this is just a SQL language um, function. And your first argument here will always just be um, dollar sign one. So in the event where you're having trouble with further, uh, further exercises, um, please see, see what you can do with, with straight SQL and, and see if that gets you out of it. So suppose we have something like this. This is a case I actually had to deal with once. Select star from publish doc D where protein is such and such, and, and it is a patent and we want to order it by patent date. Let's, let us further note here that um, patent date is included in the document and the document is some sort of structured text. Now, when I actually came across this case, we had a six terabyte database, most of which we are, I would say about one terabyte plus were of these documents. Um, a small set of those were patents, but the patent was stored in the particular, um, uh, in the text field. And it might look something like this. So you have a, you have a, um, you have a text uh, field that has some structure to it. You can identify the dates, you can identify the patent numbers, you can identify um, the registered date, which in this case would be here. Let's say it's um, the 5th of March, 1975, and we know it's a patent. Great, only problem is if we try to do something like this and we don't have an index we can use, we're going to scan through uh, maybe a terabyte of data and then try to order uh, a subset of that before we send it back and your queries are going to take a very, very long time to run. So uh, what we can do here is we can actually extract the data. We can send it back to the, um, to the user. No, no, we can send it back to Postgres and then we can index the output. Now, in a case like this, uh, SQL is really, hard to use. So the example I have is in PO Perl, and I'm, I'm sorry if people have trouble uh, with Perl, but I'll walk through the code in, um, in careful detail. The one thing that, that you'd need to be aware of is that, um, the one thing you'd need to be aware of is that the, um, uh, that there are just a few cases where it's going to be uh, difficult to, um, to set certain things up. So the first one is fairly easy. If we want an is patent function, we can do this in SQL trivially, right? So this is just straight SQL here. And all we've done is we've selected whether we have a line in that that matches uh, DB patent D. Part one, solved, trivial, easy. Part two is a little difficult and here I'm gonna walk you through the code. Um, not that it matters that much, um, but I figure you probably want a specific example of why this would, um, you know, uh, how this would work in this particular case. Um, I'm also going to give a very small motivational speech for learning Perl. Uh, Postgres has a number of languages which come with it. These languages fall into two distinct groups. You have trusted languages and untrusted languages. Trusted languages give you the ability to um, uh, write a function 
uh, and have you and have it be safe. Um, a trusted language will not be able to do anything with file IO outside of it. It can only take data in, process it, communicate with the database and so forth. An untrusted language on the other hand, for example, C, for example, PL Python um, is allowed to do anything. This means it can, you know, upload your database uh, files to uh, some third party um, FTP server. <laughs> It can delete the files out from running the uh, under the running database. It can mine bitcoins. It can do anything. PL Perl is nice because um, it's the if if PL PGSQL won't cut it for you and you have to do heavy text processing, then you are going to end up with a case where. Uh, you have to use something more powerful, and PL Perl has a trusted language version. So this is a trusted version. It could be created by somebody who's not a super user, and it is guaranteed to be safe and uh, secure to run within Postgres's permission system. Um, few of you may be going, hey, you can't use use inside a PL Perl function. Uh, use strict is an exception. It is allowed inside PL Perl. I recommend you use it. This tells Perl, please uh, provide extra compile time checks. And if I mistyped a variable, please refuse to compile and throw an error instead. With a lot of these scripting languages, that's nice. Uh, it's worth uh, using in this case. Um, here, I just take the, in, uh, the document that's come in. I split it into an array of lines. I um, do a pattern match on those lines for one that begins with regd and then has a, a series of numbers, basically eight digits that we can then parse into a date. And then I can, um, uh, then I can actually do the match and return the value. So as far as Perl goes, Perl is a little intimidating because it's very regex centered in this regard. But um, in the event where you need to do like heavy text processing inside the database, um, it's one of the better options for you. Uh, another case that I actually ran into, and you will laugh at this, is I had a client who uh, had a table of YAML documents inside the database. And then at some point needed data out of the YAML documents for various queries. Uh, and so they used the PL Pro U, but you could use PL Python and just throw a YAML interpreter in the database and, and start pulling stuff out. It, it works wonderfully. Um, though in those cases, maybe you should think about, um, are, you, are you really storing the right kind of thing? Would it be better to store JSON? The final point here is that we can create a B-tree index. And we can um, then uh, basically index the output of the function and use it for ordering. And uh, as a note, when I actually face something like this, uh, the first uh, effort that the development team took was to implement it in the front end. The problem is if you limit your queries on, on the SQL side and then you order it in the front end, you're going to have an ordering that doesn't really match anything useful. Um, the second thing, the second thing that happened was um, uh, then they tried to do it in the back end without the sort of logic, and then of course the queries just never finished. So I have a second exercise here. Uh, don't worry, it doesn't require PL Perl. All of the exercises are are completable using um, straight uh, SQL. Uh, language uh, functions. So you don't even have to go to PL PGSQL. Uh, so go ahead and, and, and try the second one. I'll go ahead and, and give it 10 minutes. If anybody runs into trouble with it, please uh, please let me know and, uh, and, and I can try to steer you towards some solutions.
Chris, do you see the question on IRC or do you want me to relay it? Uh, please relay it. I, okay. I don't, uh, yeah. Um, they're saying something exercise. Okay, I'll, I'll just copy and paste it. Okay. So the reason um, I use JSON in this in this exercise is that um, unlike these you know weird structured text files that you might get from some combined database of like Emble or Uniprot or something like that, um, Postgres already has all the operators to uh, pull information out, and therefore it doesn't require sort of the heavier processing. It might require something more like Perl.
So I'm just going to give it another like uh, five minutes or so if, if, if anybody has questions or comments. Um, I'm quite happy to, to answer them. And one further note is that if you're struggling with how to do something on an exercise, um, let me know and I can probably paste a quick uh, answer into, or I can write a quick answer into the chat or describe uh, it over here. Okay, so uh, getting on towards the types section. Um, I want to, uh, I want to uh, basically first describe the approach here. And on this slide, I'll also just verbally describe some of the use cases for uh, C heavy, uh, sorry, C language types and uh, some of the things that you might want to think about doing there. Um, but we're, we're going to go ahead and do everything here with composite types, primarily because if you're going to have exercises here, um, expecting people to code a C language data type in uh, the time we have here is um, not exactly reasonable. Um, most of these types could be written in C for heavier use. You have a lot more flexibility when you work in C. Uh, and uh, I'll come back to, to why you might want to do this in C. And we're not going to cover some of the complexities in indexing. Depending upon the type of, of um, the, the type that you're implementing, you might 
think feel like you need to implement, for example, gin indexing or just indexing. And just indexing itself is a very, very, very big field. You could be doing R trees or B plus trees or all kinds of sorts of things that, uh, uh, that, that would generally fall within the gist side. Um, and we're not even going to talk about custom index access methods. Um, but one of the reasons why you might still want to think about learning how to do types in C is that if you store, uh, for example, a tuple in the database, that's always a variable length type. Um, if you were doing certain kinds of work and you have a large amount of analytics data, for example, like adjust does, uh, typically speaking, you don't want to waste that space. So very typically you will want to write um, as much as you can into small fixed length types and then uh, save, um, uh, you know, try to avoid some of the, um, uh, or that even when you have to go with variable length types, you can optimize things a lot better in C than, than you're going to be able to do by uh, gemming them into, for example, uh, a fixed uh, field, uh, basically a fixed double type. Um, a second very major problem that you're likely to run into is that uh, once you start creating rows in a table, of a particular composite type, you are very, very limited in what you can do to change that type. Uh, in C, there are a number of ways, strategies that you can uh, take to try to make sure that you have um, backward compatibility while still uh, extending functions. Uh, but in terms of uh, Postgres's uh, composite types in this regard, you'd probably want to create a new type. So um, that's just that, that's just something that's just a, a set of warnings uh, going forward. Um, the first case we're going to talk about here, and um, I'll also describe some cases where I've actually used this approach, including with uh, with composite types from Postgres, um, is when we're talking about um, interfaces. So uh, for example, we might have a fixed structure complex uh, field in a table. Um, we could have an array of, of tuples in a table. We could be doing something that's not first normal form. Um, and sometimes there are legitimate reasons to do that. Uh, and uh, we can use them to pass uh, complex data structures in and out of user defined functions. Um, before you say, wait, JSON B can do that. Yes, JSON B can do that. But uh, you can also take JSON B and use it to populate a record field and vice versa. So, uh, so this can also be used to provide certain kinds of checks. Um, just as a note on not first, non first normal form designs, um, when I worked on a project on a major um, biotech company in Denmark, uh, Novozymes. Uh, this was the, some, the same one where we had the patent date problem. Uh, one of the problems that we had was that some of the uh, protein alignment reports were very slow to, um, uh, to pull up. Uh, and so basically what we did was instead of modeling each row in the uh, protein alignment report as a separate row in the database, we just took all of the rows in the protein alignment report and stuck them into an array of tuples and stuck them in one, um, one field. The problem with doing that, of course, is that if you delete something that a foreign key depends on, now you suddenly have um, funny anomalies when you go back to select. Uh, you can weed these out by adding a join, which seems like it's kind of defeating the purpose, but uh, at least in our case, we still saw something like a, um, I think a five to 10 times uh, increase in the uh, performance of, of these particular queries. But the uh, portion I wanna talk about here most is going to be passing data into and out of user defined functions. So we could, for example, create a type full customer as customer, customer, contacts, contact item. And you'll note that this is an array of contact item. And this is an array of address. So we could in fact define this as a complex data structure and we can use it to pass data into and out of functions. So 
we can create a um, full customer safe function, takes in a full customer. Um, it inserts in the customer and it inserts then into every, uh, every one of the contacts and it inserts uh, uh, each one of the addresses. Now, um, here's something that's actually kind of worth noting here. Um, here I use a functional notation of fields. And here I use field notation of the field. What you're going to notice here is that I have extra parentheses and it's actually kind of hard to read, right? In a lot of ways, this functional notation here, even though we're just pulling fields out, is actually a bit easier to read. Uh, you have fewer parentheses to parse in your mind. Um, well, you have the same number of parentheses to parse in your mind, but they, but they fit in, um, well, actually, no, you have, you have fewer parentheses to parse because the, the uh, once you add the unnest, um, it goes back up to the same number. Um, and so to be honest, in cases like this, I actually prefer to use this functional notation. So uh, coming back to uh, the question um, that was posted, I think here from IRC, is there a better way than raising uh, at top of function if there's no patent uh, date key? I wanna go back to, I think that this was it. Um, it there's no patent date key. I don't think we raise at the top of the function, do we? Um, I just return, I, I return a null if there's no, um, if there's no registered date. Because it's not a patent that doesn't have a registered date, so registered date is unknown. Um, so coming back uh, again. Right. So basically what we have here is we have, um, uh, we have the, the choice again between like uh, field notation and functional notation. And this is actually a, a very good case where, where functional notation makes a, a bit of readability, um, uh, gives you a little bit of readability gain. Um, and of course, if you pass a null in, we don't even bother um, evaluating it. We just pass a null back out in this case where, where we use um, strict. So uh, we can go ahead to uh, exercise three. Um, I think this exercise um, can take a little bit more time. So let's say 15 minutes, please feel free to ask questions. And if you find yourself stuck on some point, please ask. Um, I, can, I, can, I can address it or I can, I can you know, either by speaking or by pasting something into the chat.
Micah, that's a fair point. Um, it would be worth mentioning, as I say upfront, that uh, that comfort, co being comfortable writing functions uh, in whatever language is is worth. Uh, is is there something? Uh, if there's anything that that you need specific uh, guidance on, again, if or you or Russ or anybody else, uh, just feel free to post it in in the chat or uh, raise your hand and. Um, uh, I'll see what I can do to uh, uh, to help. And one kind of cool thing about Postgres is you can spend uh, basically a lifetime continuing to learn it. Uh, I still am continuing to learn uh, various parts of it. And it's been 20 years for me, uh, 21, I guess. So I'm gonna give it uh, two more minutes and then I'm gonna come back to this question that was raised on IRC, I think earlier, that um, I'm thinking maybe I may have misunderstood. Uh, and then we'll continue on the types side. Two. 
All right, so I'm going to come back to this question from IRC. Uh, is there a better way than raising at the top of the function? And I'm realizing if there's no patent date key, and I'm, I'm realizing maybe I, I misunderstood something about that. So coming back to the initial uh, question, uh, we have the two functions, which is, of course, is patent and patent date. Um, is patent uh, is fairly simple. Again, we just return uh, true or false, depending upon whether uh, DB is patent D. Um, in, this, uh, in the data extraction, uh, I'm guessing the question was actually about this use strict. Uh, use strict um, doesn't, um, uh, doesn't raise an error on running it if we're missing the key. It raises an error typically when compiling the function for Perl, when checking it, uh, to make sure that I haven't uh, made a mistake. So if, for example, I were to mistype lines, um, for example, here, uh, if with use, with you, without use strict, it would go ahead and compile and it would always just return null. But with use strict, it, it, when I go ahead and create the function, it will throw an error and it will refuse to create the function with the typo in it. So this is, uh, so this, um, so this isn't, uh, this isn't a runtime check on the key. It's a effectively, a, it, it's a, um, it's a function creation time check on my code. Uh, so if you're ever in the process of writing PL Perl functions, um, I strongly recommend using strict everywhere. So jumping back to, to things, um, tables as types. Uh, for those of you who have poked around the uh, Postgres uh, system catalogs, you will note every PG class uh, entry that's of course a relation has a corresponding type entry, PG types entry. Every table is a type, not every type is a table, right? Uh, so if we, if we um, process this, we, could, we can create methods of, for example, creating a table to another type, uh, doing arithmetic on rows based upon those conversions and aggregates on rows. And there, there are certain cases where this makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense everywhere, but, uh, but it does make some sense in, in certain cases. I just, um, I'll have some um, particular recommendations for uh, avoiding code complexity and, and stuff like that as, as, as we go through this. So suppose we have a table uh, that's work shifts, right? So we have ID, employee ID, shift start, shift end, and a bunch of fields we don't really care about for the purpose of this, um, for the purpose of this discussion. The ones that we really care about here are the start and end of the ship, uh, shift. And these will, these will typically be timestamps or maybe timestamp TZ, but I, I usually find it's, um, I, I prefer to, um, at least when I'm modeling data, I, I guess this is something of a preference issue. I prefer to normalize on a particular time zone and, uh, and store without the time zone information on it. I find that uh, I make fewer mistakes in the timestamp path in these cases. Um, now, one obvious question is how long somebody worked. So we could in fact create a function that uh, we could take a date, we could find out when somebody, when somebody worked, and we could just uh, con uh, convert the shift start into the date. So if somebody works a night shift and they work over a, a midnight, then we can just say, well, the date that we clock this on is the date that the shift starts. Oops. Uh, the second one should be interval, not timestamp here. That was my bad. This should be create a replace function interval uh, work shift. And basically we take the end, subtract the start and we get an interval. And finally, we could create a function add intervals where we take two work shifts and we basically convert them to intervals and add them together. 
So in the event where we want to do um, where we want to do some uh, arithmetic relating to um, to work shifts, we can we can create these functions to to do this. Now it's very much worth noting that uh, that if you're going to do this, you need to make sure that you name your functions very carefully. Uh, in this case, having a date function here that we can effectively use to convert to a date is fine as long as we all understand that there is a very specific relationship between uh, a work shift and a date, right? That it is clocked on a particular date on the calendar and this is, this is what this is used to do. Uh, similar with intervals, we better make sure that there is no other possible interval that we could possibly be uh, calculating. So for example, if we wanted to calculate working hours, we might not want to use interval, we might want to use working hours as a, um, as a function and then we could, uh, then we could subtract uh, the breaks and things like the unpaid breaks and things like that, uh, that, that we could then use for, for time card uh, entry or something like that. The next thing we can do is we can create an aggregate. Uh, custom aggregates are actually really cool in Postgres. Uh, I don't know how many people have played with them. Uh, but basically what we can do here is we can create a aggregate uh, that takes in work shifts and uh, basically converts them to intervals and, um, and produces something out. So I have a fourth exercise here. Uh, this one, um, Let's go ahead and give it uh, another 15 minutes on. Um, and then we'll come back and, uh, and go through the inheritance portion. Again, if anybody has any difficulty or struggles with anything, please uh, reach out and uh, I'm happy to try to uh, answer the questions. If this was a classroom or uh, an in-person conference, I'd be walking around, um, you know, trying to make myself available, so. And it's also noting, it worth noting for anybody who has trouble uh, completing the exercises that uh, you're perfectly welcome to reach out to me afterwards. Uh, and um, we can go over like, uh, you know, difficult spots, things like that. The last uh, slide has my email address and things on that. And uh, again, I'm always happy to help out. Um, but if, if you feel comfortable asking for help um, during the training, uh, or during this uh, tutorial, I'm quite happy to, to go through that.
I think based on the amount of time uh, left, I'm just going to do two more uh, minutes on this, and then uh, I'll go ahead and, and do the uh, go through the inheritance section. I will go ahead and quickly discuss multiple inheritance, though I uh, won't have a whole section on it. And then we can do the um, we can do the uh, uh, exercise on that as well as general questions. Um, Right, so let's go ahead and get going on this. Um, so uh, let's talk about the polymorphic relationship problem. Uh, this is something with which crops up more often than we would like. Um, there's a really good example, which I typically give, which is the global notes table. Um, so you might have notes in an accounting system, you have Journal, uh, journal entries, vendors, customers, invoices, uh, sales orders, purchase orders, uh, time cards, projects, you name it. People want to attach notes to it. Um, and you have a bunch of problems managing this whole thing. You can create a notes table for each one of these, which is uh, what we're actually going to look at doing. But then it becomes very, very difficult to manage schema changes when you want to add, uh, for example, author tracking to all notes. Uh, similarly, if you want, um, if you create a single table with a with a sparse uh, set of foreign keys, then it becomes very difficult to manage that. Uh, and then if you create uh, one where you uh, a notes table where you say you have one foreign key and then a field that tells you where it's um, attaching to, then you lose referential integrity enforcement and that's really not good. So typically what we're going to do is we're going to assume that each one of these has their own primary key space, um, but it may or may not be exactly this. There, there are different ways in which we can, uh, we, can, we can go forward, but basically by that we just mean that for a given primary key, we know that a particular note is attached to a particular item. So inheritance is typically used uh, or basically discussed in the Postgres community as a giant foot gun. And part of this is because people try to do things with it uh, where features were added to Postgres that didn't quite support inheritance and consequently you get a lot of frustration um, with things not quite working the way people expect them to. Uh, but the way the inheritance has in fact developed is in fact extremely useful. And it's uh, a lot more useful than people give it credit for and not just as some cool old antiquated way of doing um, partitioning. So what inheritance gives you is it gives you a collection for all of the collection entries, um, uh, including all of the sub collections. And this is really important. Um, referential integrity in enforcement can then be handled on the child tables. So in this case, you can differentiate polymorphic relationships by which table the data is located in. Um, at the same time, the parent table gives you a consistent point of management. If you add a function that takes in a type from the parent and outputs a value, you get implicit casts that allow you to um, use those on all the child tables. So I could create a function that gives me a TS vector on the parent, 
and then from there I can go ahead and uh, basically use that from all the child tables. Now this actually has one giant foot gun that is not documented anywhere. Uh, that is or, or one giant corner case that's not documented anywhere that I know of um, that can bite you if you're not careful. But uh, to be honest, I've never seen it in the wild. And that is um, the casts. Uh, in these particular cases, uh, okay, so the casts are um, uh, occur um, before the record is, uh, or at a certain point in which the record is processed on the uh, on the query, and it's uh, it occurs before any of the operations apply to the record. So, in the event where you change the um, in the event where you have functional indexes on every single one of your child tables, if you put a function that takes in a child table entry in and returns the same type of value um, and it has the same function name, then when you go ahead and create an index for that, um, you're creating an index which cannot be used if you query the parent table. In this particular case, this doesn't really matter because we almost never are going to query the parent table because we'd know, we wouldn't know um, off the top of our head where, um, where a particular node attaches. The only uh, exception to that might be something um, like forensics related, but in those cases, uh, maybe performance isn't your most uh, important concern. So while that is a concern, it's not something that I've seen as typically a live problem. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, you do need to be fairly careful about making sure that you don't redefine functions on child tables in a way that, that mess up the, um, the indexes that you want to run on the parent tables. Um, I want to mention multiple inheritance a little bit here. Multiple inheritance is actually occasionally very useful for set subset modeling where you have overlapping subsets. So if I have two, if I have, uh, for example, um, a, a common example where I've seen this happen is, for example, you have a multi-tenant application. Each tenant has their own schema. You have several tenants which license, um, say, um, let's say demographic information from a third party. In a case where I've seen it, it has been, for example, uh, information from the national voter file. So in these particular cases, you could use multiple inheritance to take the tables from the national voter file and inherit all of the schemas that these can uh, then be, um, uh, that these can then be, um, uh, queried from. So like, you know, all, all the licensing schemas. The problem with this, however, is uh, if you ever have to rename a column, you are going to have a fun time because uh, the operations can proceed down the inheritance tree, but they will violate the, uh, the checks on the other branches and therefore you will have trouble renaming columns. Uh, to solve this, you set up another parent and you inherit all the ones you want to change, make the change on the, on the parent uh, of your what's now an inheritance diamond and away you go. However, that's kind of beyond the scope of this. Um, I have a final exercise, which is again about partitioning a notes table so that you get, uh, so that you get referential integrity um, uh, attached to various things. Um, feel free to go ahead and do it. Also feel free to ask general questions. And uh, then I'll display the final slide, which has my contact information. And you're welcome to reach out afterwards with, uh, with questions or, or things like that. So I'm going to give this one about 10 minutes. Uh, if anybody has trouble with uh, how to set up primary and foreign keys on the child tables, uh, please, uh, please let me know. Um, I could walk through that. Um, but if if you uh, if you have trouble with if if you need to um, uh, actually I'll I'll just um, I'll just post a note in the chat and uh, and uh, describe it in a moment anyway.
wonder if I forgot to. I wonder if I forgot to. Um, uh, I wonder if I forgot to push my changes. Let me just check. Yeah, I forgot to commit them. One second. The, the files are, are on their way. If you check the repo or pull now, you should see them. Okay, so I... Uh, I just I just pushed them to the repo. Apparently, I did the wonderful thing where you do git add and then git push and forget the git commit in the middle. So uh, they are there now. Um, so for primary keys, it's fairly simple. So you can do something like this: create table um, employees note e. Yeah. So basically, you can you can basically just include the primary key in the uh, in the uh, parentheses for the table definition, um, and then um, then the rest gets copied in. And you can do the same thing with foreign keys. So that, that's a that's a hint that you can use um, to move forward without having to run back to the documentation a lot. Can everybody see the uh, exercises now? I'm sorry about that error. That was uh, me being stupid with regard to Git. The number of times I've forgotten to push something. <laughs> well, the funny thing is I didn't forget to push. I forgot to commit. I added it and I pushed it and I didn't commit in the middle. I'm just going to leave it at the um, at the at the thank you slide, uh, so that anybody who wants to take the contact information can do so. Um, uh, again, are there any general questions or or anything people would like some further discussion of?
think. Chris, 130 is not a hard stop. If you want to go over, you, you, you know, you can go over 15, 20 minutes if okay. you want to. Well, I, I got through the general material so um, th that I prepared for the for the for the two hour slot. So um, I, I'm, I'm fine with uh, I'm fine with stopping at, at approximately approximately um, uh, one thirty. I'll probably uh, uh, I'll probably go through like conclusions maybe in another two three minutes and then. Um, if nobody else has any questions, then we can um, then we can adjourn. But if if people do have questions, I guess we could go a bit over.
Right. So uh, basically, if you take a, a couple of points out of this, uh, the, the primary things they would suggest is that Postgres allows you to move from a, a mentality where you're merely modeling specific facts that you're storing to uh, one where you are able to model um, derivations of facts that you store. Um, and that if you want a really good example of the sorts of things that are possible, uh, I really recommend you know looking at PostGIS not necessarily just as a really cool add-on for Postgres, but as a case study of, of the way in which Postgres can be extended in, in all these different ways. Um, now, a lot of pieces of, uh, a lot of the capability, and not all of it, of course, but, but a lot of it is available straight from SQL. You don't have to necessarily learn C to take advantage of some of it. And you can take your databases, uh, database designs to, uh, to another level just simply by being able to encapsulate some of the logic that goes into calculating and presenting data out um, for, for your applications. Um, the second thing I would suggest uh, taking away from this is that uh, even a tool like Inheritance, which is very, very much maligned in the community, um, has a number of uh, very uh, important use cases where it can solve very real problems very uh, nicely. And so uh, I would recommend you know, keeping an open mind to, you know, some of the tools which are um, perhaps difficult or troublesome and um, recognizing that, that they can in fact open doors um, that might be difficult to open in, in other cases. You know, in this case, for example, uh, solving polymorphic relationships using inheritance is uh, something that maybe if you think about it, uh, from an object-oriented perspective suddenly makes sense, but, um, but it's not something that people think of table inheritance as good for. Uh, similarly, um, there are a few other cases where table inheritance can really solve some problems for you, um, but I think you know, um, there's only so much that, that we can fit in, in, in one tutorial here today. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I guess I'd open it up one more time, ask if there are any questions. Um, I did put my personal email on here rather than my work email, just simply because um, I get a lot of uh, cron messages from hundreds of servers. And you know, if you send an email at the wrong time and something has a small problem, there's a good chance that I would never see it in, in the work email. So. Um, if you have some questions or comments or, or would like some further information on something, feel free to reach out to my uh, personal email address there. Um, any other questions before we, before we adjourn? If anyone has any questions, no need to raise your hand, just unmute and ask. Mm -hmm. One question from IRC, where in the manual are relation notation for functions explained? <laughs> Let me find that for you one second. Uh, this is uh, this this is a f somebody asked me this back in in um, uh, PostgreSQL. Um, Calling functions, uh, I believe it's, let me find it here. Oh, yes, yes, here we go. Ask me this back in, in uh, here it is in, uh, I think it's section 4.3, calling functions. Can you paste uh, the URL, please? Yes, I will, I will paste it in one second. I'm just making sure I get it right.
Wait, is it positional? No. No, wait, this is this is the wrong one. I need to find uh, I need to find this. Um, calling functions. Function call is written. Uh, might be 10.3, let me just check. I'm going to have to dig through this more uh, and find it. Uh, somebody actually asked me this back in um, uh, about a year and a half ago, and we went through the uh, function, uh, basically the documentation, we found it, but uh, I can't, uh, I can't quite remember where it is off the top of my head and I'm, I'm missing it. So um, just give me, uh, I, I guess I'll try one, through one more sec, uh, one more moment. And if anybody has any other questions, I can, um, uh, I can try to answer those while I'm looking. Question on um, Zoom. I know a lot of people think that model inheritance is bad, but when are the best practices for modeling polymorphic relationships, if not inheritance? Yeah, I think uh, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, I think uh, polymorphic relationships uh, are best modeled with inheritance because it gives you a central, it gives you um, a series of tools for for dealing with that. Um, the the other options, in my view, are very, 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 very suboptimal to that. Uh, you could, as I say, have independently managed tables. You could try to do uh, you could try to do a separate column uh, to indicate what it's mapping to, or you could uh, or you could have a sparse series of, of foreign keys. And all of those have some really, really not very nice. Uh, um, uh, portion, uh, approach, uh, sorry, um, implications. So I would definitely, I would definitely, um, say inheritance is by far and a, a way the best way of dealing with that particular problem. Let's see. I've posted two URLs in the chat. I'm not sure if those answer the question or not that came from IRC. Oh, one second. That might be right. Let me just check. Create function. Right. Accessing composite types and everything. In composite types and queries. Uh, so um, yeah, so so yeah. In fact, if you look at this, um, let me let me bring it up to uh, Postgres eleven or twelve. Um, if you search, if you search that page for functional. Um, it, it calls it specifically functional notation. Right. Is that only on the 9.2? Yeah, okay, so, so it calls it, well, let's see, it calls it functional notation. It's about, um, it's most of the way down the page. Um, it's in the section, it's just above where it says composite types input and output. Uh, yeah, th that's exactly, that's exactly the, the piece of, uh, that's exactly the, um, the, the documentation that covers this. Uh, anything else at present?
There's no more questions from IRC. Okay, I'm just going to I'm just going to uh, post um, post the URL I'm looking at for Postgres 12, and it's the road types page. And in particular, what it says, I will paste what it says here, and I will read it. Um, it says another special syntactic behavior associated with composite values is that we can use functional notation for extracting a field from a composite value. Simple way to explain this is, uh, is that the notation field parenthesis table and field dot table are interchangeable. And then it goes through two queries where, where, where they're used together. All right. Is there anything else at present? If not, then I wanna thank everyone for attending and uh, thank you so much. And uh, hope to see you around other conferences soon once we can attend in person. Thank you, Chris. Thank you everyone for coming. The session's going to end now, and the next one will start. Uh, look at the schedule at two o'clock, which is 1800 UTC. Thank you for coming. Goodbye.